This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. It's a man named Grebenikov from Russia. Uh, Grebenikov was kind of a uh, non-conventional scientist. He was an entomologist, did a lot of work with uh, you know, bugs, entomology. And his favorite thing was to go out into the steppes of Russia and into the various outer hinterlands and camp out in the summers and uh, study his favorite subject. And on one of these expeditions, uh, he started seeing some weird effects. This, this is all explained in great detail on the AchilleNet site if you type in Grebenikov and his flying box or uh, gravity platform. But anyhow, the, the, the result of this was to uh, show that there was a, he found a certain bug that didn't fly, it levitated. And this was uh, he'd, he'd put this bug in t into a little uh, vial or something, and he saw this vial jumping up off the lab table, jumping up and down. And of course, this is patently impossible based on any time of normal physics. So he got into this, and he found out that the, the bug wings themselves uh, were creating an anti-gravity phenomena under certain conditions. And of course, what we have here, if, if you analyze, I, I think I found the bug. Actually, actually a beetle. And if you analyze this bug structure, you see a hexagonal pyramid structure array throughout the entire bottom wing of this bug. Turns out that beetles have two wings. The top wing is, is called a wing cover. And what the beetle does is it lifts this wing cover up and then it flips out its lower wings or inner wings. Now the, the bug cover protects the inner wings, but when it gets excited or something, it flips these other wings out and it, it flaps these other wings and the other wings, the inner wings flap a little and this beetle goes gyrating around. They can't fly very good, but they sure levitate great, I guess. And uh, anyway, he took a whole bunch of these bug wings and he glued them to like a Venetia blind structure and he put it into, into a little platform he built. So they, they were all it, these bug wings were all covered in here. And he used the, uh, I theorize he used the wing covers as well as the inner wing itself. There's also a kind of a handlebar on this thing uh, with some controls. You can see a thing a little better here in detail. Uh, the controls, I think, had to be manipulated continuously and probably vibrated to create the same action that the bug was doing. There was also down at the base some kind of a lever, which I suspect controlled the amount of uh, lift he was getting out of this thing. Anyway, Grebenikov claimed that he could fly this thing or levitate it and it would go around at a thousand, almost a thousand miles an hour. Now you ask, how can that happen? You know, well, he said that there, there was an energy field that built up around this thing due to this uh, gravity field building up in the platform and by uh, this thing building up, it built out a force field that basically surrounded him and protected him from the local environment. So even though he was flying at a thousand miles an hour, uh, you could go, uh, you know, you could be wearing your Sunday best suit and not get it flutter a bit at a thousand miles an hour. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd want to stand on something going a thousand miles an hour that's two feet square. But uh, this, <laughs> this, this picture here shows him sitting on the ground, and these pictures are much better if you get on the KeelyNet site. This is the platform with him on it about three to six feet above the ground, because here's the shadow here down below. Now you could say this is all faked, but if you get into the other things he did with uh, shape, they almost mirror the stuff that I discovered. And it, it, it proves, I guess, that you know, there's either two crazy people in the world or there's two people that have found the same discoveries. So I think that this is a valid phenomenon, and I'll, I'll show you why. Next slide is a uh, micrograph that I took of a beetle inner wing. Uh, 
This is at a 100x. If you look closely at this thing, you can see rows of bumps all along the bottom of this wing. Uh, and it, there, the, each row is staggered uh, from the next row next to it. And this is all over the surface of the bottom of the wing. Now, I don't know of any aerodynamic surface that has bumps all over the bottom to help it fly better. If you blow this up to 430x, uh, you can start to see some of this microstructure of the uh, cells that form uh, where these bumps are. The next slide at uh, 970x, you start to see what these bumps that stick up are. They're a uh, hairs, look like hairs or uh, fibers that, that grow out of the center of these hexagonal cells. And of course, this harkens back to my basic shape power discovery is that each one of these, because of their uh, shape going down to a point, is creating a magnetic field. And remember, a magnetic field is a rotating piece of vortex in the ether. It means this Victor Grabinikov, my world. Okay. I'm not showing off, I just know what it means. <laughs> okay. I have a contact in Russia named Ulane. And in roughly 1999, he sent me a URL about this Russian scientist uh, and a flying platform. And I, I, I went and looked at it. This is the cover off of the book, which I managed to get from Russia. So, <laughs> all in Russian. Uh, Grubenikov discovered something called a cavity structural effect. And it's basically what we're talking about with tubes and the uh, frequencies that cancel themselves. And also, they interact with biological and also physical material. Oh, by the way, Grubenikov says there are the two most common materials in this world are cellulose, because it doesn't decay, and chitin. Chitin is spelled C-H-I-T-I-N. That's what all insects are made out of, chitin. It's the shells, the body, beetles, roaches, butterflies, everything's made out of chitin. And it doesn't dissolve and it doesn't die. So all the dust in your house, that's billion-year-old bugs that are still grumbled and fallen. <laughs> but what's interesting about chitin, chitin is dielectric. The Casimir plates are dielectric. They repel electricity. These nanostructure arrays, when you look at them under a microscope, this is what they look like. This is excreted by the bug in growing its tissues, you know, the, the chitin. That's what it looks like as you, as you go significantly greater magnifications. That's what you see, finer and finer. Look like it's machined. It's almost perfect. Go to the next one, please. This is even a finer magnification. And these are those little resonating cavities that appear to pick up. The lower you go, the higher frequencies, like a straw with a certain frequency, like organ pipes. As the organ pipes change in, in, in length, the frequency goes up. So the deeper you go into mass with these resonating structures, eventually you're going to hit Cater's frequency below infrared terahertz, and you would be able to cancel gravity. So this, that's what all this is leading to, part of it. He, the original experiment, he's looking at a microscope. This one particular bug, he won't tell us if it's a beetle, uh, a, uh, uh, a beetle or a butterfly or some kind of a wasp. He won't, won't tell the genus of the insect. But he claims he, he had, he had uh, was looking at one little piece of it, a concave, you know, concave, it looks like a, a satellite dish. And he's looking at that under a microscope. It's a chitin plate, chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N. He's looking at it under a microscope, looking at this extremely precise uh, nanostructure array. Well, this, he, this is an electron microscope. But in this one, he's looking at these star shapes all on these concave plates. And he happened to take a pair of tweezers and, and he had another one like this and he dragged it across and it jumped out of the tweezers and floated up in the air and fell off to the side. So he thought, I've been working too long. <laughs> so he takes it out from under the microscope. He does it again and it floats up out of the air <laughs> and floats back down. So he goes out and kills a bunch of these bugs and rips off their wings. <laughs> and he glues them all to this board, da -da -da -da, like a grid, 10 by 10, something like that. And he sets it where all the cups are facing up. And he drops an ink pen on it, and the ink pen floats in the air. <laughs> he drops a tack on it, the tack floats in the air. He turns the board upside down, and the board floats in the air. It's like, whoa. <laughs> so, uh, and it all sounds like BS, but remember, fluctuations, zero-point energy, and training, the whole bit. Okay. Uh, he said, the detail broke loose from my tweezers. It hung suspended in the air, and then it fell back. He t ties these panels together, and he makes these panel blocks made out of chitin. Okay. So they're basically little repelling blocks. Okay. Um, array levitation of pin, tack, and other objects. He says, I'm not naming the class to which this insect belongs. It seems on the verge of extinction. He's a big tree hugger. I have no problem with tree huggers. But uh, he's, he... 
you know, you got to protect as much as you can. And he, he doesn't want to give the name of this because he thinks if this gets out to the world, they'll come in and take every bug they can. I wrote him a letter and I said, look, we don't care about the name of the bug. Just send us a two, couple of samples. If we can duplicate the effect, prove it's not electrostatic, it's not electromagnetic, we can make artificial, just, uh, you know, analyze it with an acoustic microscope, I mean, a scanning microscope, get the specific dimension. Is it hexagonal, you know, tet tetragon, tetragon what? And make it into an array. What is the structure, the size? Is it on angstroms, micrometers, what? And just run off sheets of this stuff. So if you, you made a pair of coveralls with this stuff, you'd float in the air like a big balloon. <laughs> so, oh, it gets better. <laughs> so, this is Grabinikov holding uh, what all this led to. It looks like a, he's an artist, so he goes out in the country and he takes his paints and stuff. This is like an artist set, and it folds up, you know, so normally it unfolds, and it's got all the palettes and all. Uh, next one, please. So he basically has hand grips. He's got a left hand grip and a right hand grip, clutch cables, like a motorcycle. And notice you got little wing nuts to attach them all. Next one, please. This fits on top of this, and that fits onto the board when it's un unpopped, when it's un the hinges are open. And it's all wing nutted together. No notice, no batteries, no light, no nothing. It's just natural. This box is hollow underneath, by the way. Next one, please. This is uh, Professor Grabinikov. This is the actual stand, what it looks like. So you stand on this thing, and you turn these clutch cables. Next one, please. <laughs> this is Professor Grabinikov standing on this machine, and notice the shadow is directly on the ground. Next one, please. And this is when he's floating off the air, in the air, from these wing structures off these bugs. Totally natural effect. No electricity, no nothing. This is the underside of the platform from the book. Now, if you notice, uh, in the upper, uh, he, he stylizes it with, it doesn't glow and have colors and all like that, but Chuck, can you pull this piece here? Uh, no, right where your hand is. Move that in the center, please. Okay. You notice all those little veins, okay? And, and he, he, said, he said, I'm right about this. So uh, in each corner of the box, he went out and he got popsicle sticks, flat popsicle sticks, and he glues 10 of these little cups on top of the popsicle stick. And he's got all these sticks lined up with a common rod, so when he opens it, he's got a Japanese fan. That's what those fans are. In the back, there's, uh, next one, please. In the, in the, there's the cups, there's the, the popsicle stick, there's the rod holding all the sticks together to form the fan. There's the four fans in the corner of these, this hollow box. One set of clutch, one clutch cable controls the two in the front. The uh, clutch cable on the other side controls the two in the back. When he opens the clutch cable simultaneously, he gets equal lift and he floats up off the ground. He wants to go, he goes up to a thousand feet. With the amount of uh, cups he's got and the repulsion ability they have, he can only go to a thousand feet. He says he, as fast as he's ever gone, 920 miles an hour. And he, <laughs> it's not a translation error. He, he says when he's flying that there's like an energy grid around him. Now, I don't know if you know much about levitation reports and stuff, but John Keeley said when he flew his flying machine that he went, floated up in the air, flew 500 miles an hour, came back, not a hair on his head was mussed. It's like an energy bubble around him. Why? Because gravity has been repelled away from you. Therefore, wind and everything else has been repelled away from you. So it's quite possible he could do this. And you say, well, all he can do is go up. How does he go forward? Well, he turns, half turns one of the clutch cables, so the two fans in the front are half closed, and that causes him to tilt forward, and he flies forward. That's how he goes. And when he flies it like a surfboard. So now you want to ride something like that? It's out in the parking lot. <laughs> okay. Now, the next one, please. When he's on this thing, he's, it's invisible. It's not totally invisible, but if you look up, you see a real thin blur. You wouldn't know what it was. Why? Because gravity is, it entrains the light, and it's like a, it goes around the ship and, or around the machine and recombines at the bottom. So when you look up, he's completely invisible. That's what he says. Uh, oh, he said, the speed of my flight is quite high. There is no wind in my ears. The platform's force field has carved out from space an upward diverging invisible column that cuts the platform off from the Earth's gravitational field. But it left me and the air column intact. I think that all this, as it were, are parts, uh, are parts of space in flight, and then it closes, uh, it parts space when he flies through it, and the space closes when he goes past that area. Uh, as far as speed and height, he says, my Gravito platform is a homemade device uh, capable of develop developing the zenithal pull of at least 100 grams which equates to 220 pounds. That's how much lift does he have. He can lift 220 pounds with this machine with the number of cups that he has attached to it in this fan configuration. He says the horizontal speed of uh, 30 to 40 kilometers a minute, which translates to 24 miles a minute. 
He says, uh, I never fly faster than 25 kilometers a minute, which is uh, nine, uh, maximum 930 miles an hour, preferring to go 10 times slower, which is roughly 93 miles an hour. That's what he writes. He says, I'm, I'm flying about 300 meters, which is 984 feet, so he can go maximum of 1,000 feet above the ground based on the lift of this machine. Okay, now the spooky stuff. <laughs> <laughs> The really spooky stuff, I, I, this is nothing. This is nothing. Okay, think about it. In relativity, they say that the, the more gravity that flows into a mass, the uh, slower the time. Okay, when this guy leaves, he gets on his machine. He looks at his watch. It says 8 o'clock. He looks at the kitchen clock. It says 8 o'clock. He goes around flying. He looks at his watch. It says 9 o'clock. He lands. He goes into the kitchen. It says 10 o'clock. His watch says 9 o'clock. Kitchen says 10 o'clock. When you go out into space, you don't age at light speed. So, but, and why? Because there's no gravity in space. You don't age. So and he said when he's in a reduced gravity environment, which is what this machine, he's inside this bubble, so he's moving at a much slower time because he has much less gravity. So every planet with its weight has a different time scale based on the gravity determined. Keeley used to say time is gravity. So always.